you would move during our time. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, this past Wednesday, I was working from my home office and I was taking a lunch break. And I came upstairs and I was eating lunch and the kids were probably causing a ruckus. And it was getting about that time where Jay was going to send the kids into quiet time. And uh, quiet time, really, you know, our two oldest, they don't really take naps anymore, but we love to create that rhythm of space. And uh, all the moms in here said amen right now. But on Wednesday, uh, Journey, over, over the lunch hour, she was asking me if I would come snuggle her. Now, can I give an honest confession right now? Sometimes I struggle with being spontaneous in the moment. Like, I'm pretty systematic in how I like to approach my weeks. And, and I started to think to myself, though, when she asked the question, I started thinking this thought. I wonder how many more times I'm going to have the opportunity to actually do this. And on the heels of that thought, what do you think I said to her? I said, yes, sweetie, it would be my privilege to come snuggle you. So I went into her room on this Wednesday afternoon, and for 20 minutes, we sat there, and uh, I laid in her bed. We were kind of snuggling, just talking, chatting, catching up. And she was giggling and laughing. I was playing with her hair. We were having just a really cool moment. And then she went on to share this uh, really encouraging thought with me. She started to share how earlier in the week, she was uh, making these cards for people here at church. Now, a little context here. I've, I've mentioned this before. Journey Lael is my little artist. Like, she just loves to draw and color. Shout out to all you artists. And uh, she's got the perfect personality for it because she doesn't have that perfectionistic tendency. She just goes with the flow. And I like to say this, that she's got a prophetic art ministry already. I mean, I mean, every other week I'm getting a card from her and it's always just spot on. She doesn't even have to write words on it. I just look at the picture and I just start melting. You know what I mean? And so she's sitting here and she's sharing about how she's praying and asking God who she could encourage and how she had made a couple of these cards already. And I just looked at her and I said, man, that's so beautiful. I'm so encouraged by you. These people are going to be so encouraged. And I love how you're just, you're allowing God to speak, not just to you, but through you. And, um, and I sat there and I was just, I kept thinking, you know, what's so interesting is I was sitting there, I was thinking about the word or the phrase that kept coming to me was divine dialogue, divine dialogue. That's what's going on with journey. And, um, so I, I told her, I said, listen up journey. I'm on assignment this weekend to preach the word of God. And we're talking about hearing God's voice. I said, I'll tell you what, can I be your mailman this Sunday at church? She's like, absolutely, dad. <laughs> so bear with me for a second. I've got some mail to deliver right now. Okay. So right here, look at this. Whoever's getting this one is really special. Kitty, come on up here. This is for you. Can you just hand that to her, please? That's, that's from Journey Lael. Um, Cap, my guy, come on. Joy, you're one of her favorites. No doubt about it. This is actually for you, Adam. As a matter of fact, here's the cool thing. Let me tell you this. Kitty and Adam, when I was having the conversation, those were the ones that were done. Okay, so she... she Let's see, who else do I got here? Okay, I got PT and niece, so y'all are going to have to get those later. <laughs> I can't transport those to the airport right now, but um, be blessed by that. You know, as I, as I started to consider this idea of divine dialogue, I started to think that the same thing that her and I were doing in that moment was what God wants you and I to do with him. The same thing that God and her were doing is the same thing that God wants you and I to do. So if you're a note taker, you can write down the title of today's message. It's divine dialogue, how to hear God's voice in a noisy world. Come on, come on somebody. It's noisy out there, isn't it? Yeah. It's a noisy world. And I, I really just want to say this, that really the big idea, if you walk away with nothing else today, I want you to, I want you to hear this uh, real loud and clear to know God personally is to hear God's voice 
continually. Write it down. Pray on that because that, that's the, that is the one message I want you to get today. To know God personally is to know his voice continually. That's what he has for you and I. And I love this quote by Dallas Willard. He says this, the greatest disservice that we can do to people is tell them that they can have a personal relationship with a God who doesn't speak anymore. Is anybody thankful in the house of God that we serve a speaking God? Is anybody thankful in the house of God today that hearing his voice isn't for the spiritual elite or for pastors that step on a stage? Because for many years, that's what I thought. Hearing his voice is for who? All believers. All believers. That's his heart for us. And how many of you know this, that one word from God can change your entire life? Come on, has anybody experienced that in this place today? I love this because uh, today in Habakkuk, we're going to learn some principles from Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk was a, was a prophet. A prophet was one who was to hear a message from God and then deliver that message to people. But before we get to Habakkuk, I want to first jump into our secondary reading, the book of John. As a matter of fact, you're going to read this in your daily reading this week. John chapter 10. I want you to see what Jesus has to say about this idea of hearing his voice. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Write those down. Go back and study this. Here's what the Bible says. I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. We know that later on in the passage, he's speaking of Satan the one that comes to devour, the one that wants to kill, steal, and destroy our lives. Verse two, but the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Verse three, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and here it is, the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he's gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him. Here it is, because they know his voice. Jump down to John 10, 14 through 16. It says, I am the good shepherd. This is Jesus speaking. So what he's, what, he's, what he's saying here, what he's about to say here is that you and I are the sheep and he's the great shepherd. He says this, I know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Verse 16, I love this because in this moment he's speaking to Jews, but he says this, I have other sheep too. They are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them in also. He's speaking of all of us Gentiles. If you're not a messianic Jew in here, he's talking about you in this passage right here. He says this, they will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Jump down to verse 27. He says this, my sheep Listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. He speaks and we listen. I love this because what is shared right here is that the only requirement to hearing God's voice is to what? To be a sheep. Everybody's just bad right now. Come on, give it to me. Yeah. That's your one and only requirement is to be a sheep. To be a sheep. Now, I've, I've visited Israel, and I've seen shepherd with, with their sheep, and it's true. The, the sheep can, can hear the shepherd's voice, and it's interesting. You go and study sheep, and they, they get familiar with the shepherd's voice, and when the shepherd speaks, they listen. Now, I did some polling this week, and I want to do, do it in here as well. I'm going to ask you four questions, and these are just more for you to kind of reflect on where you're at on this idea of hearing God's voice. I want you to write these questions down. Number one, how do you typically discern God's voice? A, through prayer. B, through scripture. C, through circumstances. Or D, God's voice is confusing. It's interesting, when I did this polling this week, 45% said through prayer, 32% said through scripture, 23% uh, said through circumstances, and 0% said God's voice is confusing. I bet in a room this size, though, if some of you are honest, you would have actually checked that one. The second question is this. When was the last time you heard God's voice? A, recently, 
B, within the last month, C, more than a month ago, or D, never. Recently, 70%, within the last month, 10%, more than a month ago, 13%, 7% said never. The third question is, is it hard to decipher your thoughts versus God's voice? Come on, anybody had that struggle before? 33% said yes, 14% no, 53% said sometimes. Here's the fourth question to consider today. Does hearing God's voice impact the decisions that you make? There are 87% of people that said a major influence, 10% said a consideration, and 3% said rarely influences. Where are you at today? When was the last time you heard God speak to you? It's so interesting that we're talking about hearing God's voice on the heels of last weekend's message, which was running from God. God was trying to speak a message, give an assignment to Jonah. And what did Jonah do? He ran in the opposite direction. And here's what I want to tell us today. I want to remind us this, that when God speaks and we don't obey and we go in the opposite direction, it's just a matter of time before we're in the bottom of the boat numbing ourselves out. This, this is another, this is like a part two of coming back and getting back into alignment with God. I think it's interesting that we see some of this principle come up in the book of Habakkuk. Now, what's so interesting about this minor prophet, and when we talk about minor prophets and major prophets, the major difference is the length of the book. The book of Habakkuk is a minor prophet, but what's so interesting about this book is he doesn't ever speak on behalf of God to God's people. Rather, this book is all about the prophet addressing God personally. So when we read this book, it's as if we're flies on the wall of this divine dialogue that is taking place between Habakkuk and God. Now, I want to give you some context of when Habakkuk lived. He lived during the final decades of Israel's southern kingdom. And it was a time of injustice and idolatry that broke his heart. This book is a poetic lament. And here's his main question that he's grappling with. He's saying, why doesn't God do something? Have you ever felt yourself in that place? Why doesn't God do something in my marriage with my kid that just can't get right? with my business, with this country. Why won't God do something? And this is the complaint that Habakkuk cries out in chapter one. And what's so interesting is God responds to his first complaint, announcing judgment in the form of a conquering enemy, Babylon coming to take them into captivity. And here's what's interesting. This was not the answer that Habakkuk had hoped for. You ever prayed for something and then God gives you an answer and you don't like the answer? Hello, somebody. So what did Habakkuk do? He prayed again and complained some more. Isn't that what we do? And that's exactly where we pick up the story in Habakkuk chapter two. Now, I want to pause the narrative here. Because I believe that as we go through verses one through four, you are going to see some principles here that we can apply to our life on how to hear God personally. And I want him to speak to you today um, as we jump into this. If you're a note taker, you can write down the first key. The first key is place. Write that down. Place. Place. It says this in verse one of Habakkuk chapter two. It says, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. Pause right there. He's saying this on the heels of the prayer that he just prayed. So he prays this prayer and then he goes to this watchtower, this guard post. Now, after he asked this question, it's as if Habakkuk was going to stand like a centennial waiting for God to answer. Now, we don't know if Habakkuk was a watchman on the wall or if this was just a metaphor, but I think it reveals a principle. And here's what I want somebody to catch this morning. Write this down. Meeting with Jesus in your place consistently reveals your desire to hear from God continually. 
Meeting with Jesus in your place consistently reveals your desire to hear from him continually. See, when you and I, when you and I show up to this meeting place consistently, it leads to proximity and proximity leads to clarity. This is the picture as I was thinking about a meeting place, the secret place. I always say this, uh, MJ, the secret place is what? It's the secret sauce. And some of you are thinking, well, God's everywhere. I can just hear him on the, on the go. The word of God, Kevin, says to pray continually. Yes, it does. But how many of you know we're called to follow who? Jesus. And what did Jesus do? It actually says in Luke that Jesus had a what? A meeting place. And the Bible actually calls it this, a lonely place, a desolate place. You know what that speaks to me? Jesus would go meet with his father early in the morning in the wilderness, away from all the distractions. So this is a word for us. See, there's something powerful that happens when we get into that place, because when we come to that place, what we're really doing is it's, it's showing God the principle, Matthew 6, It's this idea of I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. The thing I'm going to hunger for most right from the jump is God's presence. Is anybody with me? There's nothing special about the actual place for me. It's the head of the table. Cap can testify to this. Every single morning, I just go sit at the head of the table. That's my place. Your place might look different. I'm not judging your place, but you need a place. You need a place to get in proximity with his presence because when you get in, in proximity with his presence, guess what you get? You get clarity. You get away from the distractions. You get to hear from heaven, and now you can walk out the perfect will of the Father for your life. Now, right now, there are radio waves all up in the, in the sky right now. And the only way, the only thing you need in order to tap into those radio waves is you need an antenna. You need a recept, you need something that's going to pick up that reception, that's going to tune into those radio waves. But how many of you have been, have been on, a, on a trip traveling, driving down the road? You ever, you ever, like for me, when I'm traveling, I like tuning in to different football games that are on the radio, and it's always the worst you know, when you get, you start going and it's like, it's clear as day, you're locked in. And next thing you know, you start to get outside of the radius of that signal. And next thing you know, it's like, it's like clipping from the game to like some music from the 1920s. And you're like, what is going on here? This is terrible. You, you can't quite pick up. You're like hearing every other word. You can maybe hear if somebody scored. And, and here's the picture that, that God gave me today is that that's where some of us are at right now. You still have the antenna. The radio waves are still there. You're just outside of the proximity that you need to be in order to tune in. Somebody needs to catch this this morning. Is that it starts first with a place. Because, because what Habakkuk was doing here is, is he was, it was like a declaration. You saw the posture of his heart. When he went to his watch post, is anybody with me this morning? This is where it starts. And it makes me think of the scripture, uh, James chapter four, verse eight. It says this, those who draw close to me, I will draw, draw close to them. So when you and I press in in this place, it's almost like we're inviting God to press in and meet us in that space. The first key here to Habakkuk, hearing God's voice was taking his position in the proper place. And number two, if you want to write this down, it's posture. Check this out. The second half of verse one says this. So in this place, here's what he declares. There I will wait. Somebody say wait. wait, wait. I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Now, some of you are reading this and you're like, okay, cool. But I think we need to dig into this a little bit, a little bit deeper. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a posture that he's revealing to us. And, and this is the posture that I see, and I want you to write this down. It's a peaceful expectation. He says, I will wait. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna rush you. I'm not in a hurry. I will wait to see what the Lord says. He doesn't say, I will wait to see if the Lord says, he said, I will wait to see what 
the Lord says. There's an expectation in his heart to hear from God. He goes on to say this, and how he will, not how he might, but how he will answer my complaint. See, this morning, I want to tell somebody in here today, God is not on do not disturb mode. Some of you have believed the lie that God's concerned with bigger matters. He doesn't care about my stuff. He cares exactly what's going on in your life. Louis? Joach? Sam? He cares exactly what's going on in your life. Isn't that the worst? You know, when you're like texting people and you don't hear back from them. And I, I, I mean, come on, I'll just be... Full, full transparency. I can't keep up with my text messages. It's crazy. And uh, forgive me if you've been on the receiving end of that. There's nothing more frustrating. Listen, that's not God. That's not your God. There might be a delay to his response, but in the same way that there's this expectation, there's this posture that Habakkuk has that he says, God will, and I can't wait to hear what it is that he speaks. There's a, there's a level of confidence that he's walking in here. And I think that I was reading this powerful, this illustration, this powerful story that I just want to share with you. And it comes from the book Directions by the author James Hamilton. And he shares this insight about listening to God. I want to share it with you. So before refrigerators, people used ice houses to preserve their food. Now, the interesting thing about ice houses is they had thick walls, no windows, and they, were, they had like a tightly fitted door. In the winter... When the streams and lakes were frozen, large blocks of ice were cut and hauled to the ice houses and covered with sawdust. Often the ice would last well into the summer. Isn't that crazy? It says this, this in this particular story, it says one man lost a valuable watch while working in an ice house. Isn't it the worst when you lose something valuable that you care about? So here's what this guy did. He searched diligently for it, carefully raking through the sawdust, but he didn't find it. All of his fellow workers looked, but their efforts too proved futile. But check this out. It says this, a small boy who heard about the fruitless search slipped into the ice house during the noon hour and soon emerged with the watched. Amazed, the men asked him how he found it. I want you to listen to this. He said this, I closed the door, the boy replied. I laid down in the sawdust and kept very still. Soon, I heard the watch ticking. Some of you just want God to come interrupt your busy life. I just read the stat this week that the attention span of the of an adult in 2023 is eight seconds. We are overstimulated and under discipline. We wonder why we can't hear God when all we're doing is scrolling, tuning into the noise. No, we need to eliminate the distraction like this little boy gets still before the king so that you can hear his still small voice. Listen, this happened in first Samuel chapter three. This is another great passage to go study. If you want to understand hearing God's voice, this is a really powerful passage to go study. And it's such a fun story because Samuel is the boy in this story that's being discipled by Eli. And it's so interesting because in the middle of the night, Samuel hears this voice cry out, Samuel. So he gets up. And he goes to Eli and he's like, I heard you call my name. And Eli's like, I didn't call your name. So he goes back to sleep. It happens again a second time. He goes to Eli a second time and he's like, hey, did you call me? And Eli's like, no, I didn't call you. And by this time, he, Eli started to have the discernment that like, that's God calling out to you. So it's so interesting because Eli's not like, hey, you missed God. You better go chase him down and run after him. God must be playing hide and seek with you. No, here's what he said. He said, go lay back down. And when God comes back to you again, tell him, speak, your servant is listening. So check this out. First Samuel, oh, this is so good. First Samuel 3, 9 says this. So he said to Samuel, here's what he said to him. 
Go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. Here's the truth I want you to get in your spirit today. Samuel's greatest revelation came when he was resting. Samuel's greatest revelation came when he was resting. Friends, I have a feeling that some of us, we've just fallen victim to spiritual ADD. It's hard for us to slow down. We need to get, we need to get still. There's this, this posture of, of, of this peaceful expectation, not freaking out. You know, some of us, let's just be honest. If we could record our prayer times, we're doing a lot of talking and we're not doing much listening. See, I believe that this this is a principle that he wants us to get. Number one, we got to have that place. But number two, we got to enter into that place with the right. Say it with me. Posture, right? Posture. Number three, write it down. Here's the third key. You got to get yourself a pen. (laughs) Get yourself a pen. Here's what it says. The Lord's second reply. It says this verse two. Then the Lord said to me, there it is. Write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. Hmm. Here's what I want to tell somebody right now. You won't remember what you refuse to write down. You know, we're coming up on vision. It's vision season. It's vision season. I'm hearing it. I'm having conversation with businessmen and women, with friends of mine, and everybody's sort of in that mindset, that phase. You're you're evaluating uh, 2023. You're looking ahead to 2024. Don't you think we ought to desire to tap in to God's plan for 2024? We got to get ourselves a pen. We got to write it down. It's not a vision until it's written down. And some of you that are neglecting vision, going to God and asking him for that, listen, we're just going to drift into the future and nobody drifts to a desired destination. We got to press in here from heaven, get God's word, and then we need to write it down because we won't remember what we refuse to write down. I remember, um, man, it's so crazy that Jerick and I have been married coming up. It'll be 10 years this year. I was thinking about that driving the other day down. I was, I was driving past Lanahaz and I thought to myself, man, a decade with my wife, where is time gone? But I remember when we were in the dating season, oh, come on, such great memories. And we were sitting actually outside of the old stories coffee house right up there, uh, just right up the road. Some of you may know where that used to be. And uh, I remember her sharing this Uh, this particular story with me. And I'm going to share it with you because I want you to understand that number one, what I want you to hear from this is that we serve a God that speaks and he's very specific, but also the power of writing down what he speaks. So my wife was at YWAM, a discipleship program in Costa Rica before we, um, before we came into relationship with one another. And she, uh, she came back from Costa Rica to Omaha, and she was actually considering going back. Thankfully, she didn't. Um, But she was telling me this story. Well, while she was there, um, they would have these teachers come in and encourage uh, the group that was there. And this one particular teacher that came in was teaching uh, the class on hearing God's voice and praying very specific prayers. So the challenge that she gave the class was a challenge that she experienced in her own life. Um, She was sharing the story about how she was writing down things that she desired in in a husband. And then she began asking God, is there something specific that you want to tell me about my future husband that I can write down so that when I meet this man, I'm going to know that it's him. So she goes on to testify about this crazy, um, like very specific thing that she wrote down. And then she challenged the class to do the same thing. So Jerrica, she, uh, She went off and she was doing this exercise and she was in, you know, praying and whatever. And she asked God and, and the thing that she wrote down, like that she felt like God spoke to her is that your husband's going to have a lisp. Now, here's what's interesting. Some of you, you know, if you've been following my communication journey over the years, my lisp 
has improved. Like it's not as strong as it once was, which praise God for that. But I remember this. Here's what's so interesting about this. I remember being 16 years old, being recruited by major division one schools. I got on a message board um, because they used to have those back in the day. I think they still do. I know you tune into those. But I tuned into this message board and on this message board, all these high school kids were making fun of my lisp. They had posted an interview and they were making fun of me for that. So it's so interesting that that was the specific detail that God gave to Jerrica to confirm that I would be her husband. Now, here's what's crazy. A couple weeks after that, she was in the prayer room and this guy comes up and she's like, this guy's like, oh my goodness, I just kind of had this vision about your future husband. He's going to be like this athletic guy on the outside, like really strong and fit, but he's just going to be really compassionate on the inside. He's going to have a really big heart. And so then he just runs away and Jerrica's like, and it kind of feels weird having me share that, but there's a purpose to this. So... Kind of. So what's interesting is Jericho was asking the Lord, why did you have this guy come and share that vision with me? And the Lord said to her, because his name is Michael Patrick. Okay, so are you tracking with me? The guy who came and shared that word, his name was Michael Patrick. So when Jericho left Costa Rica, She knew her future husband would be Michael Patrick with a lisp. Hello, somebody. Is God good? He's specific. Sometimes I hear that story and I'm like, man, God, I want to hear you specific like that. If he did it for her, he can do it for you. There's nothing special about her. We have the same spirit inside of each of us and we have the same access to his throne room. Are you grateful and thankful for that today? We got to write it down. I love what Robert Morris says. He says that there's three things about hearing God's voice. Number one, it's innate. God hardwired you and I to communicate with him. Number two, it's learned. You got to start somewhere in the same way a a a child learns how to communicate. We adults, we need to learn to communicate with God. And number three, it's matured. Some of you in here today that you're, 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 you would fall into that category of saying, man, I've never heard God's voice. And I'm telling you, let me just tell you today, time out. Can I call a 30 second time out? This could be like a five part series this morning. So I'm not even, I can't even do this justice like I really want to, but I just really, really briefly, I want to share some of the ways that God speaks to us because if we're going to write it, we need to know where to go to hear it. Number one, the scripture, right? God sounds like what he wrote. God sounds like what he wrote. He sounds like the Bible. This is why we encourage you to daily self-feed. Number two, prayer. Oftentimes when you're in prayer, you get these impressions, right? It happened just the other day. Kappas, we're in a circle. He's praying for Kyle, who owns CrossFit Kinesis, and God just puts this impression on his heart to pray Psalm chapter one over his life and business. There's an impression that comes on our hearts in the midst of prayer. Number three is dreams and visions. And if you wanna, if you wanna go and look at this a little bit deeper, go, go study Acts chapter four. And then the fourth thing with this, which I would say is through other spirit-filled believers. Has anybody received a prophetic word from somebody in their life in here? Just raise your hand. I love it. That's what happens when, we're, when we get activated. God wants to not just speak to us, but just like he did with Journey, he wants to speak through us. Now, I wanna give you a couple bumpers. Because you ever had that person that's like, yeah, God said this? Be careful what you put God's name on. The two bumpers that you need to use, number one is the word of God. You need to test it to the word. If it doesn't align with the word, it's not God. I'm just telling you right now. Test it with the word. And then the second thing I'll I'll share with us, church, is this, is we need to have some spiritual authority in our life. We see that picture with Samuel and Eli. And I think this is something that, if I'm really honest, in Western Western culture, we can struggle with. Because this is all about the American dream, baby. I want to live independently, not interdependently. But there there is wisdom in the multitude of counselors. There is wisdom in more than one counselor. So those are good, those are really, really good bumpers. So we've got a place, we've got a posture, we've got a pen, and number four as we close, 
We've got to be patient. Multiple times here, we see the word wait. He's waiting. There's, there's this patience. And this, this word patience is really connected to the posture. It says this in three, the vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. And I think it's interesting, just context here. God is showing Habakkuk that he's, that he's got his people, that he's going to bring them back, that this, view, that this vision is for the future. If it seems slow in coming, here it is, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Verse 4, he says, look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. So here's what I want to tell us today as in regards to hearing God's voice is God's delay is not God's denial. God's delay is not God's denial. Daniel chapter 10. I love this. Remember when Daniel was praying? Listen to what it says in Daniel 10, 12 through 14. It says, then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. Look at this, verse 13. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. So I'm going to get really spiritual on you right now, because how many of you know that that's the battle that we're in? So there are moments where you lift up a prayer and it's actually being blocked in the spirit. So when I say that God's delays are not his denials, what, when, if, if there's delay in receiving an answer, you need to prevail in prayer. You need to press in in the same way that Daniel did. He didn't get moved. He knew God was going to speak. He just had to wait. He had to be patient. And look what was going on in the spiritual realm. There was a battle taking place. But will you and I remain faithful, faith-filled in the midst of the delay, knowing that God will bring an answer in due time? Are you with me today? God wants to speak to us. We see it here, right here in, in Habakkuk. And I want to just end with this story as we... As we uh, close out today because I, I heard this story in my small group this Thursday, and I thought it was such a beautiful connection to this week's sermon and last week's sermon. It's like a combination, a real life story of, of just what hearing a word from God can do in your life. And so I want to invite Sam uh, up to the stage right here. He's going to, I want you to hear this. This is powerful on how God speaks to us and receive this word today. I hope you see the, the, the principle here. If he can do it for me, he can do it for you. If he can do it for Sam, he can do it for you. If he can do it for Jericho, he can do it for you. If he can do it for Cap, he can do it for you. If he can do it for MJ, he can do it for you. He wants to speak to each and every one of us. Uh, yeah. Um, man, it's been probably 10 years since this happened. Uh, but 10 years ago, I was in the midst of a crazy season of life, and I was trying to escape drug addiction. And God had brought me into an amazing opportunity, a program, a discipleship ministry, something really similar to what we do at 180. I was right in the middle of God changing my life and setting me free from addiction. He was working. He was on the move. But I wanted to take control of my life back. And I made a decision in the middle of that season of restoration to walk away from what God wanted me to do. I felt like Jonah. I mean, I knew God was calling me into something different, but I literally wanted to run the opposite direction. I actually went to the leadership and said, I'm out. I'm done. I was four months into this program. And I said, I'm going to go back home. I had all these plans in my mind to do terrible things when I got back. I'd all, I wrote down the plans, you know but it was all bad stuff. And I was gonna run in the opposite direction. They bought me a bus ticket. They took me to the bus station and I had to wait for four hours. Uh, 
before the bus arrived. But in that time, I felt like the Lord said, just read the book of Jonah. Just read the story of Jonah. And so I pulled out my Bible, which I never should have done that. If I really, if I really wanted to escape God. But I read the story and there was so much conviction. God made it so clear to me in that moment that, Sam, if you go back to where you came from, all that's there is death and destruction. But if you choose my way, you'll be choosing life. And I'll rescue you. I will restore you. I will spit you up out of the fish onto dry ground as long as you go my way. And it was just so clear to me that the choice was life or death. And I reached back out to the discipleship ministry. I said, I'm making a mistake. Will you please come back and get me from this bus stop? I don't want to go home. I want to trust God. I want to follow him. And I'm telling you something happened in that moment. Now I went back to that discipleship ministry. I was there for another nine more months. It was really hard, but God did amazing things. And I haven't been perfect since then. I've made a ton of mistakes since then, but my life has been different ever since that day. God spoke to me in a really powerful way through his word and through his Holy Spirit. And it was like I crossed a line in the sand where I said, hey, even if I'm going to screw up a bunch more times from here on out, I'm not going to go back to where I came from. I'm only going to move forward with God from here. And I'm so thankful that God broke through to me that day. My life's been different ever since. Come on. Yeah. Now he leads 180, baby giving away what was given to him. Wow. When he shared this story, I couldn't help but just like be moved in my heart because I started to think about the Sam I know, the blessing that Sam is walking in and what he could have missed if he wouldn't have heard and obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I believe that 